and all those kinds of stuff. We, get, we have to collect that separately, um, and they charge us for that. But it's non-friable asbestos shingles is all that we take, um, and they actually can dispose of that through the waste stream, but they have to record that they can take that. So we do collect shingles from residents only. Um, so if you were working on your shed or your house or your barn, you as a citizen would be able to come in. But if you had a contract to do it, he would have to pay to, get, to dispose of that. Hey, where? At our site? Or? You'd have to carry it somewhere else. We do not collect that from, from contractors. Let us, let us look at that, um, you know, construction debris. Right. And, and, and come back. You're going to take, and, and you should have, well, if, if you'd have asked the board for a local emergency ordinance after the storm that went through, we would have done that. Okay. Um, i got to tell you, Mr. Thomas, that, um, the town was cleaning up the street, and Mr. Sheeble and Mr. Culley actually got it so the town could bring their dump truck back and forth because, you know, the, the, the north end of town was just destroyed. There's, and um, yeah. they did a fabulous job of, of keeping the landfill open. We had an employee that was helping. And rather than dump all that and then have to pick it back up and, and take it there when the landfill was open, right. they worked out where they could actually get in and dump and get cleaned up that night without having to dump it and, and, and re-pick it back up. There's yeah. nothing worse than picking something back up that you've well, dumped once. There's still a couple of trees on Main Street that, are, that, they, that they need a crane to get. So right. once they get those, I guess they'll come in. But, you know, enough fire, you can burn that. Mm -hmm. So let's just go, go ahead with what we have. Um, explain to Mr. Creasy the metal belongs to the county. He can feel free to take a bicycle if he wants, and, and we'll go from there. All righty. Yeah, my and direction, you, thank you. And okay. give us a little financial analysis on construction debris okay. as part of what it costs for us to dump it, what we'd have to charge to break even. Okay. Yeah, we'd, I mean, we could probably look at uh, construction debris landfill to carry that too specifically. Yes, we're going to adopt those changes. We need a motion to adopt those changes. You got a question? Are, are we, are we uh, doing the action on this tonight? Oh, uh, we can. That's kind of what we were doing, saying we're going to adopt the changes he's made. Including the proposed change in metal recycling? Yes. And then we're going we're gonna to give you a chance to look at it again. No, no. Mr. Thomas, if I'm I sorry. could, can I go ahead and, and make those changes because we have changed the way we do um, the too good to throw away and, right. and put that change where it needs to be and we, right. if we put it on consent for the next meeting? That's kind of what I was That way you, at least you get a chance to look at it one more time with the, the changes we talked about tonight? That's good. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do that because it is getting late. You're right. Thank you. Okay. Chief. Clarification, fire and rescue training standards. And you should probably just say you talked to the volunteers and you're all set. Yep, right after the meeting, we made those changes uh, that uh, Mr. Marmaduke came and presented before the board. Uh, they're on the second page of the letter there, and they just apply to the district and the assistant district chiefs. Uh, and one other modification in there was to add the NIMS 200 and 300 class for positions that are require that. So those are the only changes. We had the command uh, meeting that Wednesday evening, right after the board meeting. That was presented to them, no changes. Um, so I present it before you. All right, any questions? I'm happy if you're happy. All right, we don't need any action. This was just for information only, right? Because this is the board's policies, if you would just adopt this letter, and then we'll make the policies that reflect the board's wishes. All right, we'll take a motion to adopt the new uh, fire and rescue training standards. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Seeley, seconded by Mr. Black. All in favor, say, uh, discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item 10, Mr. Parton's not here. Just can I do the summary and we'll just move on because I don't think we have a lot. Um, we're still trying to get more information on what it costs to join or what it would benefit us to join PRTC. Mr. Parton told me Friday that um, sheriff vehicles were not part of this program. Buses are. School, School buses, buses are. are. So he's still getting more information. Um, we're going to try to get as much in information as we can before we look at whether we want to do it or not. Okay, so we're still trying to gather information. We can move on. If I missed anything, Mr. Cohen, that's it. We did have a request in there for a study. With the change in the way the state's handling uh, fuel tax now, starting to uh, so just if you wanted to consider or not. 
Mr. Okay, Chairman, just, did you say that Mr. Parton was getting us more information than we've got now? Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I really am not comfortable with spending $9,400 on a, a study and as, as if we can have staff get us more information than, than we have here. Might save us $9,400. Yeah, I'm a little. Um, I, I understand that's a, that's the, that's his recommendation, which is which is probably a good recommendation. But I'm a little leery of spending nine thousand four hundred dollars on a study to look at what the effect of the gas tax right. is going to be on us. You know, right now. Why would I mean? Would we not want to know? Well, at some point we we'll have to do the study. At some uh, point we may have to do the study. You're right. But if we look, yeah. if we get more information and we find out we don't want to join PRTC because of the information we get, it wouldn't be. What wouldn't other information sense can he study. provide that we don't have? Well, I know Mr. Parton was getting more. Oh, that's exactly uh, what right. is he getting more? Oh. Mr. Chairman, there is some information in here. There was a question about what the PRTC cost and a VRE cost would subsidy to, to support the administrative staff. Um, we have provided some figures in here based upon um, our calculations and potential uh, revenues from the gasoline, uh, the fuel tax. We think that the estimates from the PRTC staff are somewhat low based upon the numbers that were provided. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the history that we have or that the Commission of Revenue has in terms of, of fuel sales at the interchange. Um, but we provide some estimates to you. Um, I think the biggest question in our mind is um, with the change in the state fuel tax going from a flat 17 and a half cents per gallon to three and a half percent and six percent for diesel what the potential impacts of, of that are going to be and I think that's that's probably the one area that we um, would need to look at a little bit more I think we've got to figure a range of, of figures in here for the VRE membership costs and the PRTC cost based upon the FY14 budget. That information was provided. Okay. I wasn't necessarily a fan of that proposal, but it is with us now. So, um, okay. Uh, Mr. Finchin, let me ask this, which may be a help, because I'm sure I wasn't the only one, but. I've gotten an email or two from the truck stops. One truck stop. No, I got more than one. I only have one. I got a series from Pilot. I got a series, got a series from Pilot, but I've got some others. Too. I got Mr. Fuel. Yeah, that's the one, Mr. Fuel. That's the one we got like 30 of, which was really good. Um, is it possible that we can ask, instead of us spending the $9,400, we ask some of those truck stops if they've done a study of what the impact is going to be to them? Because I'm sure they have. I think the idea was to get an independent analysis of the impacts. <laughs> I was trying, but I couldn't keep a straight face on that. I understand. <laughs> but their skewed opinion may help. That's the thing. Their skewed opinion may help because they may portray it in the worst possible light, and then we could use that kind of as a barometer. That's all. You had something you wanted to add? Well, I just, I almost know what you're going to get from the truck stop. So, I mean, it, just from several years ago when we were at this same juncture, we were talking about uh, the gas tax and you know, other things. And if I remember correctly, the truck stop did an all out campaign against it. They talked about layoffs and how they were just not going to be able to stay in business. And I mean, so we've heard all that before, but the fact is, other localities do it. When you go to other areas, you buy gas and you pay whatever the tax is. So I mean, you know, I just think that it's, it's going to be something we're going to have to look at as uh, as a board and, and, and look at the impact it's going to have on us and make a decision. Well, well, 
that's that's a good point based on on where we were last time. This time the difference is the state has pulled out 17 cents. So if they pull out 17 cents and we charge 2% to join PRTC, maybe we're charging 8 cents. Gas gets up to $4 a gallon, it's going to be 8 cents. So their net effect would be less. Their gas should, theoretically, sell for less money because the taxes are less. What, what we have found, or, or what, what we're finding, is that on the gasoline side, assuming the savings are passed on, yes, there is, there is a, uh, about a $0.06 cent per gallon savings or, or reduction right. Right. in the retail price of gasoline. And that, but that's after they use all the gas they've got in their pumps now because they already paid the tax on that gas. On the diesel side. You did very well. On the diesel side, the change in the methodology actually increases the the price from a, the flat seventeen and a half to a little over twenty cents per gallon. Yeah, three fifty a gallon. Yeah. It, in looking at other states and gasoline prices. Um, there still appears to be a gap when you look at North Carolina. Um, again, there, you're going to find some locations where with the addition of the 2.1% fuel tax from a transportation district that there's the potential for some um, price different, higher prices here in Carmel Church than you're seeing elsewhere. For example, looking at gas prices or, or diesel prices today, um, one anomaly was down in southern Virginia, a little place called Skippers, which is just yeah. north of the state, uh, state line. Their diesel price today was actually 341.9 a gallon versus what, what our price was. So there are some differences out there. We did not get a chance to, to look at those price differences in other states in great detail. But the brief, in the brief review today, gas prices tend to be less expensive on the I-85 corridor than they are on the I-95 corridor. Right. Um, so. You don't know what that, we don't know what that truck traffic split is, how much comes up I-85, how much comes up I-95. The, the, the truck stops might be able to help with, with that split. I, I mean, that's why I said, get, let's ask them for their, you know, marketing or, or what they feel the impact is. It might be skewed, but it'll be another opinion we could factor in. The one question I didn't see, which was one of the ones I asked Mr. Parton, if we did this, the 2%, we would apply, we, could we apply to just gasoline and not diesel? No, it's all fuels. The, the, the one exemption would be for your, uh, like, buses, interstate passenger carriers. Oh, uh, can, can common carriers. Get, yeah, can get an exemption or, or a request to be reimbursed. But otherwise, it would apply to all the fuel sales. So we'd be uh, impacting the trucking industry a bit. Mr. Potentially, Mr. yes, sir. My, my concern is, I, and I went down there today, I have the app on the phone, the Gas Buddy app, the same mm -hmm. thing. I looked at gas prices in Emporia, 141, you know, 9, and in Carmel Church today, there were 340, I mean, there were 341.9 versus 347.9. If you put the 2.1% tax, now in Carmel Church, diesel is 355.9. It's, yeah. you know, you're looking at 14 cents a gallon, and in an industry where I'm sure they're Every going bottom count. line, you know, and then you do it, those tanks are... 200, 250 dollar. If you do, I mean, 250 gallon. So you do the math. I mean, you're looking at 25 dollar if it's empty, 25 dollars per truck on diesel. I mean, compared to Emporia versus Carmel Church. I mean, my major concern is it's going to be counter counterproductive to us. The other thing, and I mean, we can do. I mean, I'm not in favor of doing a 9,400 dollar study. We're going to use taxpayer money to tax them. You know, I mean, do a study, use their taxes to tax them. 
Um, the, the second thing that I have a concern about is the subsidy. We have 87 riders on VRE, according to staff. And if we're paying a $107,000 subsidy, that means taxpayers would be paying for our VRE riders $1,231 per rider. That's but didn't you just get a big parking lot over there on the western side of the county for VRE? What's that? No, not for VRE. That's for that's for a grant from GWRC uh, for commuters going up to DC. But it's not through. It's not. Through oh, okay. The, okay. Okay. It's not for VRE. But I mean, we would be subsidizing each VRE. Uh, that's 87 according to staffs. So I've heard a number of 75. So that number would go even higher. And those are just my concern is we're kind of you know cutting off our nose to spite our face here. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not sure this would be rev revenue positive for us. And I guess that's my thought as far as. At some point, a study needs to be done. My concern, my concern has been that there are tremendous transportation needs in this county. Mr. Black, you and I represent an area that definitely needs transportation improvements to. Uh, I would have liked to have seen Route 639 uh, widened and given another lane all the way from 95 over to Route 1. Uh, I would have liked to have seen 639 widened all the way to uh, Candleline Church, which was the original. Uh, process. However, VDOT says we don't have the money to do it. And so this year, the county had to take 871000 or 846000 I don't, really, don't remember the exact number, out of a proper fund that could have been used for other things to match the highway department's VDOT's 50% uh, uh, revenue match. Mr. And, Akers, and Mr. So, yeah. so, I mean, we, we need transportation issues to be addressed in the county. Well, we're and, and, do, and I and I we're not going to do a study tonight. Well, right. understand. We're, we're, we understand that the study. And the may other have thing, let's done. not forget, is with the transportation bill, they doubled the amount of money we're going to get from VDOT, but, and we have not okay. seen all of that effect yet. Okay, but I've just seen in the paper where one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars, or one hundred fifty-five million dollars, being spent, and you know, on the bridge I didn't to see one dime being spent in Caroline County. Wasn't that the road that was a lot of well, money. I don't know. Port yeah. Royal Bridge just got fixed. That's no, no, I'm in talking Caroline about the money County. that the governor just, just uh, released and it, talked about. We haven't even collected bill. the revenue yet, so I don't know that anybody can say w w what we're going to get or not going to get at this point. And if we come okay. With, come we're not going to get anything right now because it's 11 o'clock, and we're going to bring we're going to bring Mr. Parton back here in two weeks and let him give us an update. So that was a good discussion. We're going to move on to. Uh, Agenda item 11, which was the previous charter for Caroline County Emergency Services Commission. Mr. Celia had asked to look at that. Mr. Cully has a response. Um, we provided information on the, the original charter uh, and then the current charter as it exists um, for your review. Um, Obviously, a lot of the things that are in the current, uh, the original charter were taken over by the ordinance that uh, y'all adopted when you adopted the fire chief model based on the fire program study that was done of your system um, to improve the uh, uh, coordination and control of, of both the paid staff and the volunteers. Really? My view is that we're right back where the board was in 2005 with fire and rescue. We're, we're sitting here with every policy that comes before us to be approved with the volunteers sitting in the audience going, we don't agree. And, and we're, we're now becoming the fire commission in reading all those policies, going to meetings with them to talk about the changes. The fire commission is still in place, and it, they haven't met in six months. So what's happening is, is it's all of that, all of the fire and rescue changes, discussions, we end up having them. The folks that we've all put on that commission that are really skilled in that area aren't being used, and we've bypassed that. And I think that we have got to get back to, you know, the volunteers have the CCUO. Um, the chief doesn't go to that. We have a fire commission. We're not using that. So everything ends up sitting with the volunteers over here and the fire chief over here and, and us once again reading and having to go talk to the volunteers about what they like and what they don't like. And, and I thought we were trying to get that so that it was a much smoother process, but it's, it's not a smooth process now. It, it is right back where it was in 2003, 2004. I sat through plenty of board meetings where everybody was sort of at odds about what, who should be doing what. 
some of the things that the charter says that, that we say we're doing, I think the commission's perfectly capable of working with the fire chief. They are a great tool for him to use with the volunteers. You know, we're, we're, driving, we're driving a fully paid staff that we can't afford, and we've got to do something to keep the volunteers moving. And I think putting this back in place would help the fire chief, the commission, and the volunteers. And, and I've just been watching this for the last two years, and it's not working, what we're doing now. Mr. Yes, Mr. Black. I, I guess my question is, what exactly is the role of the, our emergency services commission now? Because we appoint people, and you know I understand the role of the planning commission, and um, but what exactly do they do right now? I, I mean, what exactly when we appoint them, what are they doing? I mean, is it just a board that we have a board to say we have a board, or do they have any authority? Or I mean, I, I guess that's the question. And if they don't have any authority, what's the purpose of having them? Yeah, they were originally, uh, I don't know if you wanted to respond or... Well, we, we put in there, and it's, it's uh, their current responsibilities, which is over on page two of the second part, um, that they be a uh, liaison from the public back to the, to the fire chief and, and those type of things and report to the chief. The chief works with them. I don't know that they meet that often, um, but I don't know that you can put them back totally in charge of the department and keep a fire chief. I mean, then you're going back to a director of emergency service, which you will be going back to the situation you were in before you had a fire chief several years ago. I guess my thoughts were the emergency services commission was sort of like a liaison, you know, between the, the, the chief and, the, and even the board. If the, if the board came up with a policy that they thought was, was good, uh, they would run it by the Emergency Services Commission. Now they couldn't make a decision, but we could we could take that input on certain things and help us to make decisions. They were just another tool to use. They they were not binding, you know. But right, but sort of an advisory capacity. Uh, and the other thing was that the volunteers kind of spoke through the commission, and then the commission. I thought would get the general consensus of the volunteers, and rather than us having to listen to every individual person, because everybody's got an opinion. You know what they say about opinion, and you know everybody has that. But uh, I think what the commission was going to kind of summarize and give us an idea of, you know, what the volunteers thought, and then we would take that into consideration when we make our decision. I mean, do they have? I mean. Uh, Jeff had said they hadn't met in six months. Do they have regular meeting scheduled, or does the chief call them, or what's the, what's the, how does that, well, how is it, well, how do we determine when they meet? Well, how is it determined when they meet? Chief, can you speak to that? I understand what Mr. Seeley was saying, um, and you said that we would be back to a director of, of fire services. If you just adopted the old. Right. But I think there were, there were probably, to your point, there were some points in the old charter that you wanted to pull out and, and have those. Maybe, maybe the reality is that there's not enough communication between the emergency services board, the volunteers, and the chief. I mean, we're paying the chief a lot of money. We're going to take his opinion um, and, and his experience. But there are things like the training program when volunteers, and this is nobody's fault, it's just a statement of fact, the volunteers will call supervisors directly for whatever reason and say, come meet with us. We've got a problem with these standards. It may impact the volunteers. Now, maybe that's my fault in saying, 
not that I ever would, but in saying, don't talk to me, go talk to the Emergency Services Commission. Now, I don't know that, maybe, but maybe that's what we should have done after we met with them to kind of empower the Emergency Services Commission a little more. But so. there's no, me there, we, there is no mechanism right now to empower them. They haven't met in six months, and there's been no communication with them to me. So it falls back on us again, because we're going to get another set of phone calls. We, we had an example over the last couple of days with Mr. Akers and, and uh, working with a, an issue where a, a volunteer talked to him about a, an issue that he was having. But when you talk to the command folks in the, in the station, they had worked with the chief. The chief had uh, worked with them to address their concerns, and they were working on a program of six months to try to see if it would work. Yet this one volunteer still didn't like it and was talking to Mr. Akers, even though the leadership of the group, while they didn't like it, they understand the need for it and are trying to make it work. So it depends on who you're going to talk to in the volunteer world, whether they're going to agree with what's sort of come down from the chief and worked through the leadership uh, of the various organizations. And that's one of the issues that we had with one of the other organizations. Their leadership wasn't showing up to the monthly meeting. There's a monthly meeting of command folks every month on Wednesday night following our first uh, Tuesday meeting. Um, and that particular organization wasn't represented at all, regularly wasn't represented at all. So I think some of the discussions and things about policies wasn't making it back to that department. Once we have fixed that with some other folks in that department, I think you'll find that things are better. So we may be trying to fix a problem that, that we've sort of fixed by getting everybody at the table once a month to talk about all the changes. None of these things are sort of put in without forethought and, and listening to what the volunteer said uh, about what it would do and you know why, why it needs to be done, uh, that type of thing. I mean, it's well, not just, nobody just to, comes up with policies to make it hard on the volunteers, trust me. We're just trying to uh, sometimes put things in effect to prevent problems. Uh, are the emergency services commission members at that Wednesday meeting? They are not currently, but they come from Fayetteville. Why don't we start doing that? Or every other month at least, so they'll they'll be in the loop a little more. Um, again, we pay you a lot of money. I think it's like three or four dollars an hour, so we expect a lot out of you. But if that'll help, I, I think it's really let's. See, see, you've got you've got a fire perspective. You understand fire and 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 how to fight fire and manage it and all that. The volunteers have their understanding. You know, since since we lost Mr. Roselle, we don't really have anybody that's been a firefighter. So we've got citizens as this commission who can kind of give you a citizen perspective, and that's really all it's for. So. I, th I think maybe that's, we'll start there. Let's start there. We'll start there. If you I can think invite they them. Be in, I think they should come to the monthly meeting. Yeah. At the very least, invite us. What, what can you do he and the commission staff that meeting? You know, the planning commission is, is an advisory group. That's the same kind of thought I was and, having with them as yeah, the planning commission. Uh, yeah, and I'm saying that the, planning, uh, the, the fire and rescue commission member that I appointed recently, and he called me up around budget time before the budget, and he says, Hey, why did you not give the chief this? Why did you not give? I don't want you using the commission members to bash me, to be honest with you. Uh, if you're going to use the commission members, use them across the board. Just don't use them to bash me because I'm not funding what you want. And, uh, well, I, from, I hope I, that's I not how it came about. Yeah, I'm not saying it, it was your intent, but I'm saying that's what the only time I've had any interaction with my commission member is in fact calling me and saying, you guys aren't providing, you know, and telling me how old the equipment is and how bad the commission, uh, the uh, equipment is in shape and things of that nature. Uh, but the two of them right. need to staff this meeting, to be honest with you. Uh, he is the, he's the lead guy. That's it. And, uh, and that's fine. I mean, yeah. we don't have any problem with that. Okay. And there's no issue Let's there. Let's start there. Well, Just the only other thing is when we established the commission, we didn't have a chief. At that time, when the commission was established, no. we didn't have a chief. We created the chief we, position we, after we, that. We, we did that position right. after the so that could have some bearing. The reality was when the commission was created, it was created to help the volunteers have a voice so we didn't actually get 13 different volunteer groups saying this is what we need, 13 different versions or whatever. Mr. Chairman. So, okay. 
It might, and, and I'd just like to add something to that as well is, um, as far as a lot of the part, and with all due respect to uh, Chief Loftus, I, I think a lot of times, you know, we have a fire chief for three or four years, maybe five years, they go, they move on to a bigger county, you know. Um, they provide continuity. And, and so um, you know, the concern is if, if you have a chief that's got, you know, Chief Loftus today has these standards, then tomorrow you get the new chief. I'm just saying, if, and I think that's a good idea, if you empower the Emergency Service Commission, transitions of one chief to another might be yeah, easier. You're not going anywhere, are you? I hadn't planned on it, no. <laughs> We're not no. planning on it either. Yeah. So. Okay, well, okay just so you know. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, not, not, kicking you off us. not kicking you out. All right, all right. We're just kidding on that. It's late. We're a little giddy. But I think you're right, Mr. Black. And, and I think that, that gets to meeting with the commission at your meeting with all the other folks so that you're all hearing the same story. And, and they're going to hear it different because they got a different perspective. Sure. And they're going to bring that back to us when we need it. So I, I think, think that let's would be do fine. that. Let's do that. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to get out of here because. Um, my coffee's wearing off. Uh, Mr. Cully, you got information calendar items? The county fair starts Wednesday. That it does, um, Wednesday through Saturday. Um, we did give you, um, on the back of the uh, uh, projects, we, uh, Alan included the monthly statistics for water availability and sewer availability fees. We're, hip, hip, we are uh, uh, excited that we uh, had uh, 58 paid applications for water and 57 for sewer, um, uh, which was over our 37 for new connections. Of course, we only budgeted 42 for this upcoming year, so if we can continue along at the same pace, we should be on target to exceed our budget for those, right. which you can see was a significant amount of revenue over and above what we had wow. budgeted, which will definitely help us in the utility department. Um, we do have our meeting schedule. We did get it uh, an email tonight yes. that the school board has agreed to the 22nd at 6 p.m., a joint meeting here in the, I guess, in an EOC room so we can be around the tables and all. Um, we didn't find that out. They met tonight as well and agreed. Right. Um, and then, of course, our next regular meeting is on the 23rd, the following night. So I think, I think that's it. Okay. So it's at, at 6 p.m. is when we meet with the school. Is that what they agreed to? It's Monday. We meet Monday. Oh, Monday, Monday, Monday the 22nd. Yeah, okay. right. Monday the 22nd. Unless y'all want to meet at a later later date. We've got it at 6 o'clock, unless that works for everybody. Monday the 22nd. And really, the, the, we just want to talk about the referendum. And just to get an idea from them, not because there was some discussion before. I know the reality is we're going to give them $25 million if it passes, and they do what they want to, just to help us sell the referendum. It would be better if we had some, not concrete idea, but some idea of what's going for what school. That's it. Um, what was the other thing we had to talk about? Um, I thought it was ADM. ADM numbers, numbers of Mr. Black had asked. Various, right. various uh, okay. numbers for ADM as we moved into the future, how we were getting to some of those numbers. And that's basically, we are going to just talk, talk about those two things. And those are the two things I had to inform you okay. about. Perfect. All right, no vacations on the calendar? Um, uh, Mrs. Hall will be uh, gone on the 22nd, 23rd. Of July? July. She'll miss both of those meetings. We, who approved that? You she know goes we every year. You know we she can't goes, function without her. She goes every year. I'm sorry. Can, can you go on the 29th? Coming back. Coming back on the 29th. Can I go with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're going. All That's right. right. There are a lot of all right, boy, how are we going to function without Mrs. Hall? Okay, is that it? You practicing? Don't practice too much. Closing board comments, Mr. Black. None. Mr. Seeley. I would just like to once again thank uh, Mr. Cully and Joey Schiebel for the assistance to the town during the storm of being able to keep the landfill open and being able to get all those dump trucks dumped. Good okay. job on their part. Always good to hear somebody did a good job. Uh, Mr. Schiebel. Okay. I'm sorry. Mr. Underwood? No, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Akers? Yep. Mr. Taylor? I would just like to thank Mr. Black and Mr. Seeley and you also, uh, Mr. Chairman, for coming to the Port Royal uh, Day on 4th of July. I thank 
We all had to get visitor passes to go to Port Royal. That's okay. Mr. Schiebel, what is the young lady's name that works at the landfill site that I always tell you is always working? Ophelia? Ophelia Shepard? Okay, we're talking about somebody else doing a great job. I wanted to make sure she got a shout out. Ophelia Shepard. All right, motion to adjourn, please. Nobody? So moved. So moved. <laughs> Made by Mr. Akers, seconded by Mr. Seeley. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Nay. Okay, we're adjourned. I don't have one anymore. <laughs>